Oi! My name is Diego Perilla. I'm a mining and petroleum engineer uh, from Spain. I did my master's in mineral economics at the Colorado School of Mines and the French Institute of Petroleum in Paris. I spent pretty much half of my career on the investment side, investment banking side with uh, some of the leading uh, global uh, investment banks, uh, such as JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, or Merrill Lynch, where I held uh, senior uh, roles across London, New York, and Singapore. Uh, the second half of my career was on the, uh, on the buy side, uh, initially with my own uh, fund, and then I've been privileged to work for some of the uh, largest uh, macro players. Uh, before I moved back to Madrid about uh, two years ago, uh, where I'm the managing partner for Quadriga Asset Managers. My first book, uh, The Energy World is Flat, uh, I was lucky to come and present to you uh, in the early days of, of Real Vision. Um, became a, a bestseller published in Spanish, English, Chinese, and led to a number of contributions uh, with selective media, such as uh, two inside columns with the Financial Times. Uh, my second book, uh, The Anti-Bubbles, uh, I've also had the opportunity to, uh, to discuss here on, on Real Vision, uh, which deals more with uh, macro uh, events. So to refresh the uh, framework of the uh, flattening of the energy world, uh, this is a contrarian investment thesis. Um, it argued, remember it was first put forward in uh, 2014, uh, it was a pretty different uh, world, $120 oil, the perspective of, of $200 peak oil, and also we had a very different world across other energies such as uh, natural gas with LNG uh, at $20 uh, with $2 uh, prices in the US. It was a very uh, uh, different world and the thesis was highly contrarian. It, it had mainly two parts. Uh, first of all, what I would describe as, as uh, you know, or the process has two components, the convergence across energies. Uh, this is effectively, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, crude oil versus natural gas versus coal versus other pieces. Um, that convergence across energies. The second one is the convergence across regions. So even for the same commodity, such as natural gas, we would uh, argue for the convergence uh, towards the lower end, but the convergence globally. Uh, the two together, the convergence across energies, the convergence across regions, lead to effectively a world with more abundant, uh, cleaner, uh, cheaper and reliable um, energy. So it is, uh, it is a good, it's good news for, for the world in general, but there are obviously major uh, winners and, and losers in the process. Um, the thesis uh, was reinforced uh, not only uh, proven but reinforced with the passage of time and events and uh, it was structured with uh, what we call flatteners. Uh, flatteners are forces at play that contribute to uh, these flatteners. They're obviously also inhibitors but uh, it's a very comprehensive framework that understands and analyzes all, all the pieces. Within that, um, perhaps very importantly, we challenged, uh, along with my co-author, Daniel Lacalle, we challenged uh, a number of uh, beliefs that were held very strongly in the market, uh, which can lead to, uh, to gross mistakes. Uh, so major winners and, and losers in the process. Within the framework, uh, and I think it's timely to, to review, um, I think there are two main pieces. We sliced the the, the problem and the opportunity is slightly different. The first one is what I would call the battle for demand. The second one is, uh, which is well understood, uh, the second is, is, is the battle for, um, for supply. So let's, let's look into, uh, into both of them in, in slightly more detail. Uh, let's start with the battle of, of, uh, for supply. This is effectively some kind of civil war between uh, let's say the energy producers and, and is generally been a very siloed uh, sort of dynamic. So we look at uh, crude oil, for example, and we have this kind of civil war between the different uh, uh, technologies, regions and, and processes. So we've seen how conventional crude oil uh, extraction has been competing with uh, more unconventional uh, and, and newer technologies, whether it's you know uh, Canadian oil sands or you know shale, 
or or others and and how the different countries you know whether it's saudi or russia or the us and the and the exporter dynamics so this battle for supply uh and obviously the long-term impact of of the survival of of the cheapest and, and most reliable one has been um has been very acute and has been driven primarily in the last few years with the entrance of uh, of a new technology being being shale with horizontal drilling and and fracking so these dynamics, uh, there's been a number of, of game changers uh, which have dramatically uh, shifted the, uh, the regime of the oil markets. And I think it's worth discussing shale in, 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 uh, in some degree of detail and how it's changed the, the, uh, the old regime. Uh, in the olden days, you know, we, we were uh, pre-shale, we were looking at processes where if someone gave us green light for uh, developing oil in Alaska, it would take 10 or probably closer to 15 years since the green light till the first drop of oil is actually in our cars. These are incredibly long periods, but this is the reality and the dynamic that we faced for decades, which forced us to go into technologies such as ultra deep oil, you know, where we were uh, looking for oil 15 kilometers deep with one mile uh, of, of, of salt, you know, in the coast of, uh, coast of uh, Brazil, for example. Incredibly expensive technologies that effectively were uh, um, economic uh, on a marginal basis in that old regime. The entrance of, of shale was a game changer in a number of ways. First, is, is large, is, is significant. There's been tremendous debate on whether shale is a bluff or, or not, but those resources uh, are there, they're huge. The US is by no means the, the largest uh, in, in these reserves. There are reasons why the US has been, has been leading, but the volume is very large and, and the technology works and it's there. And it, can, it, it works at, at uh, marginal prices that are substantially lower, uh, as we will discuss in more detail, closer perhaps, uh, you know, or definitely lower than $60 uh, a barrel. But perhaps uh, beyond the quantity and the marginal cost, which are obviously game changers, uh, the key thing is the time to market. So we've been seeing a response in two ways. First of all, from the green light to getting that, those drops of oil is three to six months, which is dramatically shorter than the 10 to 15 years we were used to. And second, you can also open and close the tap literally without hurting the fields. This is something that didn't happen before, where producers were, uh, if you stopped producing in a low price environment, you could dramatically hurt the pressure on the field and therefore impact the resources uh, negatively. So these dynamics have made uh, shale, in, in, in my view, a, a, a real contender, a game changer, and it has changed in the dynamics in, in multiple ways. So the battle for, for supply is better understood on the price action and on how it impacts. The second part uh, of the, the, uh, the discussion and, and the uh, thesis, which is less uh, understood, is what uh, I would call the battle for demand. And this is something that, uh, uh, again, uh, we're looking at effectively different uh, sources of, of uh, energy, be it crude or natural gas or coal or others, competing for, for demand. And historically, in post uh, the 1970s, uh, what we saw is the energy world really divided into two. The transportation, uh, which has been heavily dominated by, by crude oil and, and by OPEC, and the other, i.e. mainly industrial and power generation and, and others. In that sense, what we've seen, and very often when we talk about energy, we're talking about transportation, we're talking about crude oil, uh, that's been, let's say, King Oil's turf pretty much uh, undisturbed. And what we've seen uh, through the development of uh, other resources, the, in particular the globalization of natural gas and, and the development of the energy broadband, as I call it, the, the impact of the technology and, and which brought natural gas in the US through shale to literally $2 a MMBTU, which is about you know, $12 to $15 per barrel oil equivalent. Um, and the fact that we had Fukushima sending prices 10 times higher, $20 and MBTU, uh, $120 with, with LNG. This sharp difference, this sustained price difference was a very strong price signal that led to major investment in LNG. It broke this duality of um, contracts that were take or pay. It created singles 
uh, where we had uh, liquefaction that would find its way and it contributed to the globalization of, of natural gas. Uh, this is truly major because natural gas went from being an unreliable regional source of energy to a more reliable, cheaper, of course, uh, environmentally friendly, but uh, abundant uh, source. And that led this globalization of gas. It has been, in, in, or it was in our view, a key challenger uh, in, in a number of ways for crude oil's dominance in the uh, transportation. So in that sense, um, the dynamics on, on the battle for supply and the civil war across uh, producers for a given silo and the dynamics on the battle for demand, which are in a way breaking these silos and interconnecting them, not only in the power generation, which has always been there, that dynamic of competition between nuclear and, and, and uh, coal and, and natural gas and, and now renewables, but also in the transportation space, which was pretty much uh, oil's uh, kingdom, which is uh, being challenged in, in, in a number of ways. OPEC, uh, it's been uh, a major um, driver of oil prices pretty much since its creation in the, in the 60s. It was uh, obviously behind the, uh, a lot of the dynamics that we saw in the, in the 70s. And as I just described, this dynamic where the energy world broke between transportation and another. Uh, one of the key things that we, uh, the concepts uh, or the beliefs or, or misconceptions that we challenged in, in, uh, in the book at the time, and that I think is still not well enough understood, is it's this perception that OPEC's success has been driven by an oligopoly of supply, meaning I have the oil, therefore I control the price. And it, it makes sense, um, you know, I, I would argue that the fact that there are over 45% of the, uh, uh, let's say, production, uh, over 80% of the proven reserves uh, at current, uh, creates this obvious control. But I would argue that this is a necessary but not sufficient uh, condition for, for the success. In that sense, we've seen also other markets with very large dominance, which haven't had the success of OPEC. And um, the real reason is that it is not just about an oligopoly of success. It's not about, I control the oil, I control the price. What OPEC success has been about is a monopoly of demand. So when you have a situation where transportation has been pretty much uh, oil, uh, oil and oil products, whether it is we talk a lot about oil, by the way, but uh, what we really use on a day to day is gasoline, is diesel, is jet fuel, is, is, is fuel oil. So in that sense, uh, this uh, dynamic where we had the combination of strong uh, demand growth and uh, the fact that crude had really no, uh, no challengers for the reasons we, we discussed means that the actual real reason why OPEC has been successful is the um, uh, monopoly of demand. And, and this can lead us to, to major mistakes. And, and so I hear on a regular basis how people talk indistinctively about the uh, uh, transportation demand and oil demand. Now, one of the arguments used for, for peak oil was, look, China and India are going to come in with so many cars that, of course, our oil demand is going to continue to grow up forever. And this is a basic uh, mistake or misunderstanding because effectively we're confusing transportation demand, which indeed may or may not continue to grow, with oil demand, because it is perfectly possible that this incremental demand might be met by other uh, sources. We've seen, uh, obviously, electric, but uh, we'll talk, I guess, in more detail about other um, drivers, such as uh, natural gas and it's, it's how it's played out in, uh, in, in LNG into you know, heavy uh, industries such as been uh, long-term transportation and rail and, and buses and, and many others. So uh, I would start my the first thought I would leave with OPEC is yes it's been incredibly successful but not just for the reasons that you might think which is the idea that they control the supply therefore they control the price but more because of their effectively monopoly de facto so over, uh, over uh, demand, which I would question on a medium to long term basis. And in that sense, remember, this is uh, really a, a, a marginal uh, barrel game. Uh, so it's, it's not about 
uh, you know, the, the average is, is really about the marginal barrel. Now, beyond that, and with this very big picture, let's obviously in the short to midterm, OPEC has been uh, and remains hugely influ influential for the energy markets. In particular, we are currently in a process where OPEC and its current 15 members have uh, reached an agreement with uh, a number of allies, which brings them over to 24, including critically people like Russia, uh, which effectively have uh, agreed to cut about 1.2 million barrels um, since uh, January 2019. Now, this 1.2 million barrels comes approximately 800,000 from uh, uh, OPEC, 400,000 from non-OPEC, where the, the, the big uh, part comes from Saudi, about 320, and uh, Russia, 230. So together, Russia and, uh, and Saudi represent roughly half of the cut of these 1.2 million barrels a day with a number of other um, uh, contributors. Uh, this, these cuts are uh, meaningful, back to my point on, on marginal economics, relatively small uh, changes in, in, this, uh, in the supply can lead to significant changes in prices due to the low elasticity of, of uh, demand on the, on the consumption side, which is, you know, last time I looked, it was about 2%, meaning 100% move up in prices, in prices can, can actually just to a 2% uh, reduction. So you can see what major uh, impact it could have. Uh, people talk about this new OPEC as OPEC plus, you know, the facto uh, expanding with, I call it ROPEC, uh, because I do think that it's really about Russia and, and Saudi, uh, the, the, like the meaningful players. And this is something that has uh, the rationale here. This comes from, uh, you know, post, let's say, 2014-15, uh, when they let the market forces play. Oil goes from 120 to, to sub-30. But this is, you know, it, it broke another of the strong beliefs in the market, which is, uh, you know, the, the OPEC put. This idea that Mami Saudi and Davi OPEC were always going to be there, able to control the price. But we saw that this dynamic um, effectively broke. And as the price sold off, producers who at the end of the day uh, care about the, the, the fiscal side, how much money they earn, were actually producing more, not less, in a, in a low price environment, which effectively accelerated the process. So this. Uh, conception, this belief, this misconception of the uh, of, of the um, the OPEC put uh, proved to be weak and something uh, I, I presented before it happened as as the BTU that broke OPEC's back and something that uh, remains like a like a big challenge in the in the market. So I would argue that OPEC uh, for the short medium term will remain very powerful, but the real rationale following this move was inventories. At the end of the day, a scenario where production exceeds uh, demand or consumption uh, leads to uh, an increase in inventories. And this increase in inventories, um, once it reaches certain critical levels uh, and you approach full storage, effectively leads to the collapse in, in, uh, in spot prices, uh, which creates these negative dynamics. Now, it was the high level of inventories that really drove uh, all the uh, OPEC members to, to get their and, and allies to get their act together. And what we've seen is a normalization of, uh, it's been a big success, is a normalization of inventory levels closer to five-year averages, which is the target uh, that, that OPEC has. They don't really want to be in either extreme. Of course, uh, by no means, you, you, you always want to avoid the scenario with full inventories. That is an absolute disaster for them, uh, but a, a market that is too tight, uh, it can also create problems because uh, effectively this, uh, un unlike what common sense might tell you, these spikes, whether are geopolitically driven or other, can actually lead to, to strong supply responses. Uh, and that's something that the, I think a lesson learned by, by OPEC. So how does this translate into, into the crude oil markets? And, and let's start with, with Brent, which is uh, you know, the global more reliable benchmark. As most of you know, um, WTI, West Texas Intermediate, is subject to, to bottlenecks. Uh, so it may not be a fair reflection of, of the actual uh, dynamics in, in, on a global basis. Brent is widely accepted as, as a more reliable 
what we've seen is a, is a, is a true roller coaster in, in prices. Over the past five years, we saw uh, you know, $120 oil going all the way to, to sub 30. But even in the last year, we've seen crude going uh, you know, from closer to $85 to, um, to $50. Um, this, uh, there are a number of drivers that we'll discuss in, in, in more detail, not only micro supply and demand driven, uh, but also uh, macro. Um, but beyond the price action in, in the front end, I think I'd like to highlight a couple of things which may not be uh, on the radar for, for most of uh, the, the viewers. Um, the first one is long-term prices. So what we've seen is that whilst the front has had in the last year a $35 uh, range, call it 30 to, to uh, sorry, 50 to, to 85, the long-term prices, the five-year uh, forwards, have had a much, much narrower uh, move, closer to, to about $10, somewhere in the high 50s to, uh, to the high 60s. Now, this is critical to understand and is a major uh, change relative to previous past moves. What the market is really telling you is you know, this dynamic uh, that I described earlier with the, with the inventories, a scenario where the long-term prices are more anchored to this sort of 60 odd, uh, around $60 a barrel. It's been influenced by a number of things, but very heavily by the um, shale producers. Um, effectively, they uh, enjoyed the, the early days of $120 oil and this uh, almost free, free money. The market uh, collapsed and, and went way farther than, than most people anticipated. That created a, a mini uh, energy crisis and the, the funding, the ability to, to actually pursue these projects has been uh, since heavily influenced by, by a much more cautious approach. So what we see and you know all this debate about when and at what price level is, is shale economic or not, the proofs, the proofs in the pudding. At the end of the day, the producers are quite happy to lock in uh, at least for a portion of their production pr uh, prices around $60 a barrel, which gives you a strong uh, confirmation that they're actually, uh, you know, that they generate profits, they're highly economical um, below that. Um, this is uh, acted as a, as a key, uh, let's say, anchor in long-term prices. This is different in some ways to how the previous spikes happened. And in particular, I would say 2007, 2008. At that point in time, the rally in crude oil to, let's say, 120 in the front had two key dynamics. One was a very steep contango where you know, long-dated oil prices were substantially higher than the spot based on this perception of belief, you know, of peak oil and, and, and panic. And, uh, but that was almost free money for people like Canadian Oil Sands and others who could actually hedge in in a, in a contango uh, market. But it was also driven by the very, very strong uh, uh, crack spreads, uh, effectively the, the strong premium and the, the value of, of the refined products, which at the end of the day is really what, what this market is about, is what we, we consume. So I would say that beyond the, the, the short-term dynamics and the spot price, we also need to pay close attention to, to this back end. And, and, and this is something that I think OPEC, uh, it, it actually makes this move uh, and higher prices much more, um, let's say, durable. Uh, it's, it's a much more, a much healthier, if I may say, rally, at least from the perspective of the producers, because they're keeping in check uh, the, the threat of entrance to some degree of other technologies by just ignoring or letting the long dated prices go pretty much in full flow. So whether it is the actual hedging or there's a much more controlled process, uh, I think it, it works and it creates this dynamic of backwardation, which uh, it re is really good news for the, for the producers. Um, you know, a relatively small cut, we're talking about 1.2 million barrels a day uh, in a market roughly, let's say of 100, uh, it's, it's tiny. The, the fact that you know, Saudi is cutting 320 uh, relative to the 10 to 11 that they're, they are a million that they are they're producing, it's a very small uh, cut to a much significant price increase. So it's a no-brainer for the producers to, to play that game and keep those and enjoy those high prices. 
the fact that they can do that without the threat of uh, all these other technologies makes this uh, a lot cleaner. The third comment I would make is that if you look at the graph, there's some small subtle dynamics, but very, very relevant, which is the shape of the curve, not just, let's say, the front to the five year, but the first few spreads. And the first few spreads in Contango, if we see what happened roughly a year ago, I think in, in August, uh, prices were pretty close to where we are today uh, in the low mid 70s. But the market was in Contango in the front. Today, we have the same prices, but it's steady backwardation. This is fine print, but it's big difference for the energy markets. Uh, front end Contango tells you, hey, I have uh, the, the inventories are probably on the closer to, you know, much more fuller. Uh, we are not so concerned about the physical. It's, it tells you a little bit uh, about the, the health of the, of the physical markets. And, and what we're seeing today is with a similar price and, and, and arguably lower uh, forwards, we also see uh, long data forwards, we also see tighter um, uh, spreads in the front. It is hugely relevant and significant in, in my view, and it's a key driver to watch because whilst the prices might lie or might be distorted by, by other factors, the time spreads, the shape of the curve is generally a very, very uh, you know, good and reliable indicator. So the fact that the front end spreads are backward dated tell me that this is, this is uh, for real. I mean, this is something that is, the market's a lot more robust, arguably, than, than it was with the same price level and, and contango in the front. Within the context of, of OPEC cats, uh, as we've seen, uh, 1.2 million barrels, um, one of the big drivers and, and perhaps the wild card in the, in the energy, in the crude market, has been Iran. Um, we are well aware of, of the uh, disputes, the, the nuclear accords, and how Trump uh, decides to effectively review those and, and, and reinstate uh, sanctions. Um, Iran is, is not only in reserves, but also in production is, is huge. I mean, uh, relative to the 1.2 uh, million barrels per day of, of cut uh, in, uh, by OPEC, we're talking about Iran, a country that it's been producing uh, 3.8, close to 4 million barrels, exporting under normal conditions north of 2.3. Uh, Trump has been said, you know, to, to, to effectively want those exports to go literally to, to zero. Um, and, and it's been a bit of a political wild card because, you know, as we can see, uh, the impact of switching on and off Iran uh, is twice bigger in, in quantity potentially than, uh, than OPEC uh, cuts. And we, in, and we understand the power of, of this uh, uh, marginal economics. So the fact that those uh, sanctions uh, are fully applied is huge. It's huge for obviously Iran, who suffers uh, in, in, in a number of ways. It suffers, it's also big news for, uh, for the marginal uh, economic of, of the barrel. Um, but what we've seen is this wild card being played also in the form of waivers. And that uh, actually contributed uh, heavily to, to, the, to the speed of, of the sell-off in a way. Uh, yes, uh, Trump might want to hurt Iran, but then when, when this translates into much, much higher oil prices, then he will uh, agree to do some, some waivers which are expiring or have just expired. Um, so uh, Iran is and will continue to be a, a, a key driver uh, of the energy markets. I would say that it's, it's very difficult to, um, to model, but I would argue that uh, you know, it's if prices do spike uh, significantly, the waivers will come back. Yes, yes or yes in, in one way or another. Uh, the consumers, whether it's China, China or, or uh, India or Turkey or, or Greece or, or even Italy, uh, countries that uh, would be heavily negatively impacted by, by this will have enormous pressure. And obviously it leads to other questions uh, such as compliance, uh, etc. But we have seen uh, compliance uh, perhaps taking taking place uh, uh, when it's been done. Uh, I would just caution against the, the this wild uh, 
uh, wild card, <laughs> which uh, can effectively lead and contribute to these swings uh, fairly quickly. Um, in, in that sense, the, the order of magnitude and, and the relevance for crude is, is very, very important. Moving from uh, the, the crude oil side, which, uh, as I said, we, we talk about crude oil all the time, but nobody actually uh, buys crude oil, uh, other than the, the refiners, pretty much, and the, and the specs. Uh, it's, it's all about the products. It's all about the refined products. It's all about diesel. It's all about gasoline. It's, it's, it's jet fuel and others. Um, I, I'll highlight a couple of key dynamics. One, in the, in the long term, we've seen the sort of uh, diesel uh, diesel gate, all these, these scandals uh, leading to, to significant uh, debate and, and, and policy changes, which obviously impact uh, gasoline versus diesel. But these have been pushed out uh, quite a number of years. So they are, you know, big changes potentially, but uh, more on the medium long term. What is really driving, you know, for, if you speak to anybody involved in the oil markets on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the key uh, driver is, is IMO 2020. This is the effectively maritime um, standards. This is the biggest change in, in environmental standards pretty much ever, uh, which is uh, impacting uh, the shipping industry by effectively removing the ability to, to burn uh, high sulfur fuel oil for, for uh, imposing uh, much higher standards. Uh, and whilst the fuel oil market is roughly about 7% of, of the demand, about 7 million barrels uh, um, per day, it can actually have huge influence in a number of ways. Um, the alternatives and, and the timeline is, is really close. We're talking about Jan 2020. Uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, limited options so if you're if you're a ship you either install a scrubber to, to desulfurize there's uh, long queues and prices and bottlenecks involved in the process um, that's uh, let's say uh, option one the second one is to go and, and buy the, uh, the, the the cleaner products which uh, in itself puts uh, pressure on the on the refining side where uh, the ability to deliver uh, uh, this this sort of um, a cleaner, cleaner products is not something that we can just do like this. It, it, it takes time and, 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 and prices. Or third, in, in the short term, uh, we could have other than demand destruction and, and other drivers, uh, a mix, mix of fuels. Um, the, the view is that beyond the, the I mean, there's going to be a significant impact on, on the middle distillates, um, you know, where, where it's not just about diesel, it's also about other, other sectors including uh, jet fuel. So the question is, w will it be implemented? What sort of volume and price impact will, will it have? Uh, the general view is that environmental issues are just too high in the agenda. Uh, ESG, 80% um, of the, the ships uh, are controlled by about 20% of firms, which are you know, heavily focused on, on, on ESG compliance. So the general view is that it is going to be uh, accepted and implemented. Um, the the problem is, you know, and the numbers vary, but people are talking about one to one and a half million barrels of incremental demand for for the middle distillates. Uh, you know, if you add that to to OPEC, you add that to Iran, it, it really starts painting a, a pretty one way picture in in, in some ways. Um, to the point that, as I said earlier. Uh, once it starts having a significant impact, uh, there's always the risk of delays or others. So you are playing, once again, with uh, a number of, of uh, variables that are harder to control and they can effectively go on and off uh, with, with significant uh, impact. What, what we see in, in, the, in the market in terms of price action, we've seen the, uh, the gas oil um, diesel cracks uh, about $12. Uh, it's the medium to lower sort of range of, of uh, historical. However, the curve, if you look at the, the shape of the forwards, is, is quite it's reasonably contangled. Um, so medium long term spreads are closer to $17 a barrel through the combination of backwardation in crude and, uh, and a little bit of flat-ish uh, 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 products and contango. Um, 
This, to put it in perspective, in, in 2007, 2008, we saw these spreads blowing um, beyond $40 a barrel. So it is possible that we could see a significant price move and, and a number of the investors in this space see uh, some opportunity here, uh, which again, uh, whilst we look at the uh, crude oil prices on a, on a day-to-day basis, fewer people look at the actual impact, uh, uh, the real one, which is, is crude plus the crack, it's, it's that differential. So we could see that uh, uh, you know, as a significant move. So I would say that the, the, uh, other than that, the, the demand and the demand growth for products remains robust, inventories remain at, at adequate levels. Uh, but uh, this this risk of IMO based on where the, uh, the the spreads are, where the where the cracks are, uh, the risk is probably skewed to to higher. But we've seen this movie before and and, and many times, and we see how, uh, in my view, uh, you know you need to watch for that really binary event of you know it's not inconceivable to see a spike and then. Uh, what I think is one of number one rule of the investment game is they can change the rules. So I think if things go uh, significantly against uh, the, 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 the interests of, of, of the US and, and a number of other key players, then uh, those rules uh, could, be, could change. So beyond the crude and products, uh, which are obviously very important and very relevant and, and uh, there's obviously the energy space is, is much broader. Um, the I would highlight uh, natural gas as perhaps uh, you know one of the most important and, and, and perhaps not not well enough understood, and the impact that it has uh, both on the, on the on the battle for supply and the technology and how the dynamics have resulted in in major uh, growth uh, and also the dynamics of the flattening of the energy world and how this is created much more global and abundant. Uh, this becomes really relevant when you compare uh, the, the, the current prices and, and the forwards uh, for uh, crude oil and, and natural gas in apples with apples terms. So uh, you might see, again, even with the, the current uh, lower uh, forward structure, as we discussed with five-year oil uh, around 60 uh, plus, uh, we see how natural gas in the U.S. Uh, it's roughly in the region of you know twelve to fifteen dollars, um, even slightly higher, but sub sub twenty dollars uh, barrel of oil equivalent. This is a a major uh, flattener. Um, we saw, for example, and this is something I highlighted long before. I mean, uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, when when he bought uh, the BNSF, the, the you know one of the largest uh, railway companies in in North America, um, at the time it was the second largest consumer of diesel in North America, uh, only behind the uh, the U.S. Uh, military. Now Warren Buffett, amongst many other great uh, uh, ideas and rationale to do this, I think humbly uh, it was it was an energy play. He knew those uh, trains were paying uh, $160 a barrel for, for diesel uh, with 120 plus, plus the spreads. He knew that natural gas uh, it was suddenly shifted from being the US being uh, an importer and unreliable and expensive source to effectively having hundreds of years of, of uh, proven reserves without any threat from OPEC at uh, you know, low prices with, um, uh, again, reliable, uh, abundant, and, and of course, very clean. So uh, the idea of shifting those uh, trains uh, you know, as a one-off from diesel to, uh, to natural gas in the form of LNG makes a lot of sense or made a lot of sense. And it's something that I, uh, I believe it, it was part of the idea and it's, it, and it's been done. But as a flattener, think about the impact of the second largest consumer of diesel in, in North America suddenly consuming uh, less barrels uh, of, of diesel and obviously consuming something else, being in this case natural gas. But all those barrels of diesel that Warren Buffett doesn't consume anymore are suddenly available for somebody else. Uh, and and the, the product exports did, did not apply 
to, to products. It did, they did apply for a while to, to crude. But effectively, what you see as a flattener is that uh, for heavy transport, such as uh, trains, uh, which go from point A to B, and then they don't need to stop in the middle for, uh, you know, uh, for gas station type. Uh, these, these guys who can build the infrastructure, there was a ginormous incentive uh, eco economic to effectively switch. And this is, this is a key driver. Renewables have been also another key, key driver and dynamic in, in, in the market. And you know, this is something that I, I discussed really big picture already a long time ago. When you look about, for example, solar or, or wind, uh, I've always been much more positive on solar, uh, simply and keeping it uh, very basic. It's almost the difference between physics and chemistry, right? When you have uh, wind uh, blowing, uh, our ability to convert that, the efficiency uh, is already uh, at asymptotic levels. We are uh, already, from an engineering perspective and for a long time, pretty much maxed out in terms of how efficient the, the, uh, the wind uh, can be. However, uh, the solar to me, uh, it's been a bit more like, you know, the, the megapixels in your, in your phone. I mean, you, you, have, uh, you have seen uh, dramatic increases in terms of the, the efficiency and, 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 the, and the cost. So what we've seen in the last few years is, is how solar is actually coming uh, and is now able to compete on its own no need for subsidies uh, this is a this is a significant game changer so effectively we've given uh, preference uh, to to renewables uh, when that means that when the wind blows then uh, suddenly uh, energy kicks in and with solar uh, you know when, when the, the sun shines or in, the, in different ways you, you get that and and the fact that we now have volatility of demand and volatility of supply uh, makes the balancing act uh, much more difficult. So it is fascinating how the dynamics are impacting beyond crude and, and, and natural gas and, and renewables. Uh, coal is really one of the biggest losers of, uh, of, of this, this, the, the flattening of the energy world. It's been hit uh, by environmental issues. It's been hit by, by the growth of natural gas. But ironically, I'm actually very bullish on clean coal. Uh, and other technologies, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, once coal is so cheap that it is actually worth burning that coal as long as you do something about the capturing of, of the CO2 and, and others. So all these dynamics uh, keep pushing us into into a number of dimensions, which I think contribute to uh, to, to the flattening in general. Uh, and and in what we've seen is is, is some of these silos. Um, you know, in, in the energy world, you would have an expert in, in crude oil who had absolutely no idea about or the natural gas or, or, or renewables or coal. Uh, this is something that, uh, you know, we, we challenged and, and I believe that we are um, starting to see much more interaction. This is not everybody understands how Saudi uh, might be very successful uh, cutting the marginal barrel of supply and therefore creating the prices high. But people seem to forget the mirror image, which is every electric car or every LNG on the demand side is also uh, one barrel on, on, the, on the margin. So to summarize, um, I would say that from a big picture perspective, uh, the flattening of the energy world is, is relentless. Uh, the, the convergence across energies, the convergence across regions, the battle for demand, the battle for supply. These are all contributing in, in many ways to what most of us or you know, what the world something would benefit, which is lower uh, energy prices, abundant, cleaner, um, reliable. However, there are significant challenges in the, in the short uh, to medium term. Uh, OPEC uh, continues to, to have a strong uh, grip on the market. Uh, Iran, it's a wild card that will continue to add significant volatility and environmental standards such as IMO uh, 2020 will and can potentially add additional pressure to, to prices. So uh, whilst the long-term picture might be more subdued and, and lead to this uh, positive news, we need to be mindful and careful of these spikes and the potential uh, response uh, 
you know, which could come very quickly from the market. So I think brace yourself for potentially more volatility uh, whilst the market keeps advancing in, in, in hopefully the right way.